Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number three. I hope it finds you doing well. Uh, It is cold and rainy right now here in upstate New York, and it feels like, I don't know about where you live, but it feels like we go nowadays right from summer to winter and from winter to summer, and spring and fall, if we're lucky, might last a day or two. If we're really lucky, maybe a week. This year, uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was 71 degrees, and then the next day it was 30 degrees, and I think it has maybe gone into the low 40s since then, but it just feels like winter is upon us, and we actually have our first forecasted snowstorm uh, that's supposed to be coming in tonight into tomorrow. Not a big snowstorm. I think they're forecasting about an inch, uh, but winter is on its way, and If the long-range forecast prognosticators are correct, then we are looking at a long, cold, and snowy winter. Now, I will believe it when I see it. Um, The local uh, meteorologist can't seem to get tomorrow's forecast correct, so I'm not sure how I'm supposed to believe in a forecast that's several months in length, but hey, we'll see, and we'll take it as it comes. Anyhow... You didn't tune in for a weather report. Let's jump right to homestead happenings. What's been going on 3B Farm and Homestead this week? Well, as I said, winter's on its way, and so we are in the midst of prepping for winter. And I don't know about you guys, but it always seems to sneak up on me. Uh, And what I mean by that is there are certain things that really work better when it's warm out. And one of those is coiling up hoses. Last night I I found myself out in the yard coiling up hoses. It was cold, they were stiff. And so instead of having these nice pretty stacks of coiled hoses in my shed, I have once again this winter a tangled mess of spaghetti. You'd think I'd learn, but I never do. It just all I always feel like I've got more time than I do, and then all of a sudden, bam, winter comes in, and I am left with a mess because I've waited too long to coil up my hoses. I'm also uh, a little bit behind with regards to greasing my tractor and my snowblower. Uh, again, those are things that work much better when it is warmer and not quite as good when it is cooler, but I'll still go ahead and do it. Um, But that's really been a big part of what's going on here on the homestead, is really prepping for winter. Now, yesterday I also was finally able to get around to uh, grinding up the uh, peppers that I've had uh, lacto-fermenting over the last couple of weeks. I think they they fermented about three weeks. I probably should have let them go a little bit longer, but I was really worried about mold. And one of the things that I didn't have when I started this process, I do it in mason jars, and one of the things I didn't have when I started this were the um, tops, the mason jar tops. I've since ordered those. I have them here. But I was getting some calm yeast on top of my peppers, and so I wasn't quite sure how long I wanted to push that. I also had another really big jar, um, and I was really struggling to keep the the peppers submerged underneath the brine, and so unfortunately there was some mold buildup there, and so I elected to just dump that jar, which was really disappointing because I think it was a gallon jar of peppers that I ended up dumping to the chickens, turning them into eggs, but certainly it was not what I wanted to do. But that's what's been going on here on the homestead. The the pepper sauce really came out um, very good. Not great, not the best um, pepper sauce I've ever had, but it's very interesting. I did a mix of peppers. It was actually sweet and hot peppers, so that made a really mild sauce. I made another sauce that was 
a combination of Brazilian starfish peppers and a few habanero. Well, they're actually Caribbean red hots. Um, and that's a little bit milder. I'm sorry, a little bit warmer than the, the mix. Uh, then I did one that was a mixture of hot peppers. It included um, the Caribbean hots, uh, Uncle Jim's hot, uh, volcano peppers, mariachis, habaneros. I can't remember. It's a whole, uh, just a whole mixture. That one's a little spicier. And then I did one that was a straight Caribbean hot pepper sauce. And that one, whoo-wee, fire. In fact, my mom and dad stopped by last night. And so I uh, got out some crackers and said, hey, dad, let me, uh, you know, go ahead and try these sauces. And so we worked our way from the mild up to the hot. And my dad is not a wimp when it comes to hot sauces, but that Caribbean hot sauce, uh, it kicked his butt. And he ran over to the sink and he grabbed the glass out of the cupboard and he stuck his tongue in there to try to cool off the fire. It is wicked hot stuff. A little dabble do you. And uh, so anyhow, that's what's been going on here on the homestead. On this episode's segment of Community Corner, I wanted to talk about something that happened this week with regards to the father of a well-known YouTuber, and that's Justin Rhodes. Justin Rhodes' father passed away this week, and it's been something that they've been documenting over the last several weeks. I think all of us knew that it was coming, that Boots wasn't going to bounce back, and Justin had really, and, and Rebecca had really been alluding to that over recent episodes uh, on their YouTube channel. And uh, a few days ago, um, Boots did pass away. And one of the things that's really been very interesting to me as they've been going through this process, and especially when Boots first became sick and they let people know that, is the amount of support um, that just really rose up and people that were sending gifts and cards and so forth. Um, that's one of the things that I really, really love about homesteading. On this podcast, you are going to hear me talk a lot about self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And those are uh, goals that on the surface perhaps seem a little bit selfish, a little bit self-centered. Again, the, the term self-reliant, self-sufficiency, sustainability. But I think really with those terms and those goals, where they really thrive is within the context of community. I think when we are trying to become more self-sufficient, more self-reliant and all of those things, where this really shines is when we are helping one another, when we are learning from one another. And we have this understanding that we are not an island unto ourselves. We need each other. Now here in our local area, honestly, I have really struggled to find that community. I think I'm starting to establish that community and looking to grow and foster that community here locally. But I've been doing this for over 10 years now. And it wasn't until recently when I started being able to connect with other people here in our local area who have similar interests and similar goals uh, like we do. Besides my mom and dad, my immediate family, there weren't a lot of people that I knew that were interested in pursuing self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. There weren't a lot of people that I knew that were interested in raising and growing their own foods. In fact, when we first moved back to this area, uh, a big part of our social circle really revolves around our church family. And so when we moved back to this area, we were going to a church that was about a, a little over a half hour away from here. And it was comprised of people who live in suburbia. And so to a certain extent, when we named our farm 3B Farm, it was a little bit tongue in cheek. I never thought of myself as a farmer. I didn't see this as a farm. And again, I wasn't using the term homestead to describe our operation here. But because we raised chickens and because we had animals ducks and so forth because we had a garden, we preserved food and all of those kinds of things, people kind of started referring to this as the farm. And they asked us, well, how are things on the farm? And then it became, well, 3B Farm because of our names and, and it kind of just stuck. But we have not had here locally 
a lot of community when it comes to homesteading. Now, about four years ago, we started going to another church that was l closer to us. And through that, we have started developing relationships and contacts with people who do share uh, similar goals and ideas uh, with us. But one of the things that has kind of filled that void for me up to that, up to this point, has been the community that I've been able to develop online, whether it's through YouTube, whether it's through being involved in Facebook groups, uh, through the American Guinea Hog groups, but I've been able to develop some of that community and to feel some of that. And it has been very beautiful to me to watch uh, that community, even though to a certain extent I'm an outsider, I'm a bystander, I'm not directly involved in in what's going on with, with, in this case, Justin and Rebecca, but I've seen it through other people in the homesteading community who have had difficulties and the community has rallied around them. And I just find that to be a very, very beautiful thing. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about homesteading is the community aspect. And so right now we are working here locally to really try to grow that, to foster that, um, because I think that's very, very important. And so obviously I, I doubt Justin will ever listen to, Justin and Rebecca will ever listen to this podcast, but obviously our condolences go out to them and the loss of boots. But it certainly is beautiful to see the community rally around their own when things like this happen. So that's it for this episode's uh, Community Corner segment. Let's jump right into charting the course. On our last episode, I spent quite a bit of time trying to answer the question, what is homesteading? And on this episode, I'd like to continue on with some of those thoughts and attempt to answer the question of how or where does someone get started homesteading? Again, going back to my definition, I believe that homesteading is a lifestyle and it's a journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance and sustainability. And so if that is our definition of homesteading, then where do you start homesteading? You start right where you're at. You see, that's one of the reasons why I don't like the definition of homesteading being about where someone lives and what someone does. I see that as being a definition that can serve as a barrier that either keeps people from homesteading or it at best delays people from homesteading. Because what happens? People look at that and they say, well, I don't live in the country or if I do, I don't have 5, 10, 15, 20 acres of land, so I can't do this. Or people might look at it from the standpoint of the what's and they might say, well, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to can. I don't know how to freeze. I don't know. I don't know how to plant a garden. I don't know how to raise chickens. And so I, I don't have this skill set. So I can't homestead. I can't be a homesteader. But when you think of it from the standpoint of it being a journey, now your perspective changes. And instead of looking at what I don't have, now our perspective is what can I do in the situation in which I find myself? What can I do with the things that I have? What can I do with the knowledge that I have? You see, I believe, in, and, and it's not just a belief of mine. If you do any kind of research, you will find that there is a really a, a very large urban homesteading population. There are people who live in urban areas, some people who don't even own a square inch of land, and yet they are successfully homesteading in these urban areas. Now, they're having to get creative. They don't have the luxury that I do of being able to go out into my backyard and to plant a garden or to raise chickens or, or whatever. They're having to get creative, but they are because it means that much to them. And so they are working uh, with landowners uh, to turn front yards and backyards into food forests and gardens. They're working with municipalities to take abandoned lots and turn them into uh, community gardens uh, or to turn them into micro farms. They are um, having to get creative, but they're doing it. They may be growing tomatoes on their balcony or they may have uh, a vertical planter in which they're growing herbs and lettuces and, and those kinds of things. 
yes, it's not an optimal situation, but they're not allowing the where's and the what's to get in the way of them pursuing self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And this is happening all across the United States. I was reading an article not too long ago about an initiative in Atlanta where they're taking um, some green spaces and turning them into community food forests. In uh, Detroit, they're taking abandoned lots and turning those them into bee farms. In Dallas, there is a micro farm that was established taking abandoned lots and it's been turned into an area where they're raising chickens and goats and vegetables. This is happening all across the United States, but it's not just happening in the United States, it's happening around the world. Uh, a couple of months ago, I read uh, a post on Facebook where some people who live in Australia, um, and they claim to have a 800 square foot backyard. Now, I've never been there, I don't know them personally, I can't verify this, but their claim was that they have an 800 square foot backyard. And from that 800 square foot backyard, they are raising 80% of the food they eat. 800 square feet and they are raising 80% of the food they eat. The pictures of their pantry were mind blowing. Now they're having to be creative. They're having to do succession planning and they're having to do container gardening. And what they're doing in some cases is they're overproducing a particular product that they're then trading with other homesteaders to get things that maybe they cannot raise on their homestead. But out of their backyard, 800 square feet, they are producing 80% of the food that they eat. And it's not just happening in urban areas, it's happening in suburban areas. People, and if you follow the news at all, there have been many, many cases where people have fought to be able to keep backyard chicken flocks. Um, and they're working to overcome zoning laws to make sure that they're able to do these kinds of things. But there are even people who live in dreaded HOAs who are successfully homesteading. Now, they might have to be a little rogue and do things a little under cover of darkness, so to speak, but they're doing it. They're not letting the where's and the what's get in the way of them realizing the journey of homesteading. They maybe, maybe they can't have chickens, but they have rabbits that they keep in cages on their back porch. I even saw a guy who was not able to have chickens, who wasn't able to have rabbits. So he got really creative. I, I thought this was so amazing. I thought this was awesome. He went and he bought a huge uh, fish tank and he put it in the middle of his living room and he is raising quail in his living room in this huge fish tank. Now he's got his eggs. In fact, he posted a picture of an omelet that he was getting ready to make from quail eggs. He's harvesting quail that he's eating. Is it optimal? No. But is he on the journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability? Absolutely. And I think that's what matters. So where do you start? In my opinion, you start right where you're at. Now, you may say to me, well, Brian, I don't have the skill sets. I don't know how to do X, Y, and Z. I wasn't born into this lifestyle like you were. And I totally get that. You know what? I don't have all of the skill sets either. I'm always trying to learn new things and different ways of doing things. So what are some ways that we can acquire the skills that maybe we don't, we don't have? The first thing that I recommend are books. Now, I know. We live in the digital age. Why in the world am I recommending books? Well, the reason why I'm recommending books and the second thing on my list are magazines is because there's at least some semblance of vetting that takes place with regards to books. Now, that's not to say that they're always going to be accurate. My grandfather always used to say to me, Brian, no paper ever refused ink. But at least there is some semblance of investigation that's done into the background of the author, that they actually know what they, they're talking about. Um, where we, when you're online, you're dealing with Joe Schmo from Idaho. You have no idea whether or not he's been raising chickens for two weeks or, or 20 years. Um, and so that's why we're, we'll get to internet resources here in a little bit, but my initial resources for you are going to be analog resources, books and magazines. I know, not very sexy, but 
I think uh, they are great, great resources and should not be overlooked. Now, before you go out and spend a whole lot of money establishing a homesteading library, my recommendation to you is to go to your library. Your, your library may work a little different than ours, but ours is part of an association. So if I have a book that I want to read and my local branch doesn't have it, they generally can request it from another branch and I can read it. And so I've been able to try a lot of books before I buy um, by doing that, by requesting them through my library. And then as you read those books, you may find some that really speak to you and you may ask for them for Christmas, birthday presents, or you may just decide to buy them uh, on you on uh, Amazon or I was in the uh, a used bookstore the other day and I picked up a couple of, of books. And you, you kind of keep your eyes out for them. But again, books are a great resource and your library in particular is a great resource for you to learn. Magazines are also another great resource. And some of my favorites are uh, Grit Magazine, Hobby Farms, Mary Jane Farms, uh, Mother Earth News. And actually my mom gets me those uh, for Christmas every year. She does a subscription to those for my wife and I. Um, another another great uh, magazine is Cooper's Farmer. So magazines can be really, really great resources that can help you learn and acquire certain skills. Now, moving on to the internet. Again, the issue with the internet is that you never know whether or not Joe Schmo from Idaho, who's giving you advice, is actually knows what he's talking about. Uh, <clears throat> I have seen so much really, really bad advice given on um, certain websites, certain forums, certain Facebook groups, um, even by some of the more well-known YouTubers. Um, the thing I think that people get lost in is that these people that are on YouTube putting out homesteading content, and I am not belittling them by any stretch of the imagination, but a lot of them are just as new to these things as you are. And they may only have a six month jump on you with regards to raising chickens or re with regards to raising pigs. And so you need to take that into consideration. Just because someone has a YouTube channel does not make them an expert. And, and that goes for me. You know, question what I say. Just because I have a podcast or I'm starting a podcast does not make me an expert. And so take what I say with a grain of salt until I've proven myself to you that I know what I'm talking about. And folks, I don't claim to be an expert. I think I stated that in episode number one. <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert in anything. But I know a little bit about a lot of things and I want to be able to pass on what little bit of information I have to you. But YouTube, podcasts, blogs, Facebook groups, uh, MeWe groups, websites like Backyard Chicken or Part-Time Permies are all great resources. You just have to keep in mind that not everybody is as much of an ex expert as they claim to be. Another great resource for establishing skills are hands-on classes. And what I have found, at least in our area, is through our library, periodically they will have classes that aren't specifically for homesteading per se. They don't have homesteading in the title, but they deal with skill sets that are commonly associated with homesteading. So maybe on how to raise plants or grow plants, things of that nature. Um, we also have a great community college in our area that offers adult continuing education. And they send out a flyer in the spring and in the fall. And usually in that, there are things that would be skill sets that would be homestead related, like how to make compost, how to graft apple trees, how to take care of bees, how to make soap, all of those kinds of things. Through the State University of New York, there is a program called the PACE program. And periodically they do classes on how to process a pig, how to process beef. Um, and again, those are where you get hands-on education whereby you can learn certain skill sets. Also keep your eye out for certain businesses. 
uh, we have a business, uh, the next town over, that periodically offers a class on how to make soap. Um, and they partner with a local farm that makes goat soaps. They come in and they do a class on how to make soap. We have a local company that is that sells beekeeping supplies. Periodically, they offer classes on how to keep bees. So those kinds of things, you just kind of have to look around in your area and talk to other people. But there are really, really great, uh, at least in our area, there are, in, in our area certainly would not be a bastion of homesteading, at least that I'm aware of. Um, and yet those things are available. But then there's also conferences like Homesteaders of America, Mother Earth News Fairs, which also, as part of the package, you can sign up for certain hands-on classes whereby you can learn certain skill sets. But to me, the best way to learn, well, this is the second best way to learn, is from a mentor. Find mentors who are willing to work with you and who are willing to help you and answer your questions. I have a great mentor who happens to be the vice president of the American Guinea Hog Association. And he has taught me so much with regards to pigs. He has come up and helped me learn how to castrate pigs and how to uh, feed pigs. I, I raise American guinea hogs, so there's a kind of a special approach that you have to raising and, and caring for American guinea hogs. And now I am mentoring a friend of mine who purchased American guinea hogs. I'm going to be going to his house next week and we're going to be castrating some piglets. And so I had the opportunity to be mentored and now I'm going to mentor somebody else. And I think that's really, again, going back to what I mentioned in the community corner, that's a beautiful thing with regards to homesteading is that this pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance and sustainability doesn't happen in a vacuum but rather we can help one another and I can learn something from one person and pass it on to another. And I can learn something from that person and pass it on to the next person. And so we're constantly uh, refining each other and helping each other get better um, with regards to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. But the absolute best way for you to learn how to do things is just to do it. Too many people get paralysis by analysis. You know, they, they, they spend so much time researching a topic. And folks, don't get me wrong. I, I think you need to be careful before you jump into certain things. But there comes a point in time to where you've just got to do it. Just do it. Do the things. Do something. Now, don't overwhelm yourself going overboard. And we'll touch on that in another episode. But do something. Folks, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. It's going to happen, and that's okay. Remember, this is a journey toward self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. It's a journey, and part of the journey, sometimes there's twists and turns, there's peaks, there's valleys. Sometimes things work, and sometimes they don't, and it's okay. You know, look at the situation. You say, well, what can I learn from it? It didn't work. How can I make it work next time, or do I just need to give up on it? But folks, just do it. How do you get started in home setting? Where do you start? You start where you're at. Start where you're at. And you start on that journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And I really think that if you're here and you're listening, if you've made it to episode number three, you're on your journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And I am glad to have you on the journey with me. All right. Let's close out this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast with another homestead hack. This one actually does not involve any kind of technology. On the first two, we talked about uh, Google Keep and we talked about Google Sheets. This one has to do with buckets. On your homestead, there are a few things that you will find extremely uh, invaluable. Things like cattle panels, things like uh, duct tape, things like a baling twine. But one of those things that's right up there are buckets. And I have found a place where you can generally get buckets. And you can get good buckets for free. 
And that is at your local grocery store, if they have a bakery and you contact them, many times they will be willing to save the buckets that the frosting comes in. And those are good buckets. They're food grade buckets. Some of them have really nice seals on them. So you could use them for fermenting. They are at least at our store are really, really great buckets. So if you are in search of buckets and you need buckets and I always can find uses for buckets on my homestead, check out your local grocery store, your Walmart, uh, maybe a local cake maker, because those buckets that the frosting comes in are awesome buckets that you can use on your homestead. Now, you may be able to get them through the deli as well, but a lot of times the ones from the deli have had pickles in them or they've had you know things that might leave a bit of a smell or a bit of a taste. So if you're wanting to uh, use them for to, to put food in, then they may not be the best choice. But if you're just wanting to use them to cart water back and forth to your animals or out to your garden or to harvest uh food into and bring it back into your house, then they might work for your purpose. But the best ones, in my opinion, are the ones that the frosting comes in. So that is this episode's homestead hack. I hope you find it very helpful, but stay away from my grocery store and don't be after my buckets. <laughs> All right, folks, thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. I hope you found it helpful. I hope that it will encourage you and inspire you towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. If you like what you've heard, if you could pop over to iTunes and leave us a review. If you've got questions or comments, please send me an email to thehomesteadpodcast at gmail.com. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment below and I will be sure to get back to you. So folks, thanks again for joining us on the homestead journey. And until next time, keep up the good work.